New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. How did the relationships of two pairs of U.S. presidents change the course of history and the world we live in now? We'll answer that question and many more with today's guest. But first, hello, history lovers, and welcome. You know me, I am your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on IR Radio. And a special tip of the hat to everybody enjoying our time travel adventure via the History Author Show YouTube channel. You can find me at historyauthor.com and search through our archive of over 250 interviews. You can also find me on social media platforms. Those are all linked at the website. Plus, you can read my columns in the New York Sun to get my analysis of current events through the lens of the history I've learned from all these books on the shelves behind me. In this episode, we'll meet the man who wrote the latest book. His name is Mike Purdy, and he brings us Presidential Friendships, How They Changed History. This book digs into the relationships that each of the presidents Roosevelt, Theodore, and Franklin had with men who would rise to the presidency themselves. William Howard Taft was T.R.'s hand-picked successor, as they say, in 1908. Of course, they later had a falling out in 1912. And Lyndon Baines Johnson is a much younger man. He's looking at a long career ahead of him as he gets to know the President of the United States during World War II, his Commander-in-Chief, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mike Purdy is a regular contributor at TheHill.com, so he's the perfect man to bring us this book. He's also the founder of PresidentialHistory.com, where you can find his award-winning presidential history blog. Plus, he's the author of the book that's also here on the wall of greatness behind me. That's called 101 Presidential Insults, what they really thought about each other and what it means to us. You can find our interview about that book in our archives. And that's kind of the flip side of this, even though T.R. and Taft might have been frenemies at times. What a, what a president says in anger about another president or says when they think nobody's listening or maybe unfortunately in this modern era when they are listening, just like a friendship when they're hashing things out, I think that's very informative. So these books are a little bit of bookends for you to enjoy if you love presidential history, want to learn a little bit about our leaders. Please do visit our guest at presidentialhistory.com. You can also find him on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Those are all linked on the historyauthor.com page for this episode. Okay, now that we've traveled back to the first half of the 20th century, when Roosevelt's occupied the White House and sought out friends and protégés that they could mentor, learn from, and exchange ideas with, let's join Mike Purdy and dig into these two fascinating presidential friendships. And here we are with Mike Purdy. He's the author of Presidential Friendships, How They Changed History. Welcome back to the History Author Show, Mike. Thanks so much for having me back. I appreciate it. Well, I enjoyed your previous book very much. 101 Presidential Insults, the name of that previous book, that covered all the presidents in these private moments, griping with each other, at each other. And to me, that's that's something that in a republic especially it really brings brings them down to our level we don't we don't want them always to be up there on the pedestal cast in bronze and it, it reminds them that they are human beings just like us and what their opinions were were not always kind and not always high-minded so now here in this book presidential friendships you go somewhat in the other direction the way that i see it. you go from focusing on all of our presidents and them saying things that maybe some of them I'll, I'll be generous they wanted to take back but certainly weren't kind insulting each other to just four presidents two pairs the 26th 27th 32nd and 36th presidents and you go into each of their private friendships which are very different from something you might say behind somebody's back or insulting them even in front of a camera when they're not around so why did you choose to do that and look at how they were able to influence each other's public service? Well, you know, the in some ways, the Presidential Friendships book is really a, uh, a continuation in one way of my interest. So for many, many years, I have, as I've done reading and researching and writing about the presidents, I have been um, struck by the connections between these men and that they 
they knew each other. And of course, you know, sometimes when they knew each other, they didn't like each other. And so thus the, the presidential insults. But, you know, as I did in the presidential insult book, you know, I tried to document the context for those quotations. But here I wanted to go a step further and say, um, what was really behind those relationships? Um, and, you know, you mentioned that these are very human people. And um, and I think sometimes we forget the fact that um, our presidents are very human. And how do these relationships, how do these friendships, and there's different kinds of friendships, even within this book, between uh, Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, on the one hand, and Franklin Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson, on the other hand, um, how do these relationships end up changing the course of history? So I think my interest in doing this book is to, um, to kind of illustrate the humanity of these men. And, you know, my, my dream for years has been to do a comprehensive book about um, all presidential friendships. Maybe it would need to be titled presidential friendships and feuds, because there's a lot of uh, relationships between presidents that were not very good. And sometimes Again, right within this book. We'll yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Taft and TR. Yeah. And um, so but I didn't feel like uh, I had the time right now to do that. And so I wanted to get out um, to the public, at least these two sets of stories. In a way, the insults book and this friendships book the taft and tr ones I, I believe tr is the first quote of your book and i haven't i haven't looked at it lately but it stuck in my mind was an insult that that taft slings at or tr slings at taft and they part of the friendship and i think any of us who have a, a good friend is you look at taft of course we he's forever the largest president and or so we assume and that, that's right. how he sticks in our minds and tr would give him a hard time and taft was the kind of guy who loved a good fat joke and he liked to tell them himself and i think that's an interesting foundation for their friendship because taft would by definition with tr being so bombastic would, would probably have to be willing to just take him going off the handle and it's just how he always was and so for the two of them as peers and we'll get to fdr and lbj later and the the letters by the way matter we're going to bring those up but TR and Howard William Howard Taft, they're they're close and they're peers. They're guys who come up together a bit, get to know each other. TR uh, finally offers his friend a choice when he's president, and he, he has this kind of weird, typical, I guess, TR thing to say at dinner that I, I have the ability to see the future, and I can I can see you will either be president or the chief justice of the Supreme Court. So, how do they get to that moment where they're sitting down at dinner? Because your friend might offer you, oh, you want a light beer or an IPA, and that's the best choice you get. But here, he's offering him. You could be, you could be head of one of the two branches of the United States federal government, and that's that's just what he offers them while they're sitting there at dinner. So, how do they get to that spot where they're that close? And Tr has that much love and respect for him that we know now is foreshadowing for that falling out later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's a, it, it's a very good warm story of their friendship and then of course it goes sour but um you know i think the foundation of their friendship was really secured when they were in their early 30s they're both in washington dc taft had been appointed solicitor general uh, representing the uh, government's cases to the supreme court roosevelt had been appointed um, a civil service commissioner and they met early on during their, their time in D.C. I think for Taft in some ways that he was lonely. I, he went to D.C. feeling like nobody uh, was going to pay any attention to him, that he didn't know anybody. And he meets this charismatic Theodore Roosevelt. And, and they live in the same neighborhood together. And they walk to work together. And they have lunch together. And they talk about, you know, families and politics and careers, and they share their dreams with one another. And so they're an odd couple. They're, they're so different personality-wise, but 
at that point in their lives, they connected. There was a spark in that friendship. So during their careers, of course, they helped one another significantly. And this is how we get to the point of this you know, famous White House dinner. So Theodore Roosevelt is, um, after his civil service commissioner uh, job and uh, Taft had already moved back to Ohio to be a, a federal judge, Roosevelt goes to New York as police commissioner. And he kind of, after a couple of years, burns his bridges there and needs to get out. It's politically untenable for him. And so he is searching about for what's his next gig and where's he going to go. And he decides he wants to be assistant secretary of the Navy. He'd written a well-known, um, uh, well-respected book on the Naval War of 1812 when he was still in his 20s. And he goes, hey, how do I get to be assistant secretary of the Navy? There's a Democrat in the office right now. And um, so his only hope was that um, a Republican would win the presidency. So Roosevelt stumps for William McKinley. And of course, McKinley and Taft are good friends. They're both from Ohio. So other than stumping for McKinley, Roosevelt goes and asks Taft to speak to the then president-elect McKinley. He has a number of other friends talk to McKinley. And McKinley isn't um, too enamored with Roosevelt. Um, Roosevelt's too bombastic for him, a little bit too much of a loose cannon. And um, But eventually, Roosevelt prevails, thanks in large measure to Taft's influence. So there's an example of Taft helping Roosevelt in his next job. So then, you know, Roosevelt has this, you know, furious, fast career after that. He's the assistant secretary of the Navy. He ends up um, uh, resigning that after about a year to uh, fight in the Spanish-American War. He becomes a war hero. He uh, jumps into the New York governor's mansion. Um, then he becomes vice president. I mean, all within this short period of time. Then um, McKinley says, you know, he needs somebody to help run the Philippine Islands. And so Roosevelt's got a great candidate in mind, and that's Taft. And, you know, throughout their relationship, you see Roosevelt um, calling Taft by all of these wonderful superlatives, that he's the best guy ever, you know. And um, so Taft is plucked from a fairly obscure federal judgeship in Ohio. And of course, Taft had great political pedigree with his father was, you know, Secretary of War under Ulysses Grant. But still, Taft would have been just as happy to be a judge his whole life. He becomes governor general of the Philippines because of Theodore Roosevelt. Then McKinley is assassinated. Roosevelt becomes president. There's a vacancy on the Supreme Court. He knows his friend wants to be on the Supreme Court. And so he offers the job to Taft. And this is a complicated story here that Taft says no, his lifelong dream, um, for a couple of reasons. One, he says no because he has this great sense of duty and he still feels there are things that he wants to do in the Philippines. But the real reason behind it was his family um, and especially his wife, Nellie, um, who wanted him to become president, didn't want him to have a judicial career. So Taft says no to Supreme Court vacancy. Um, relationship with TR is still intact. A couple months later, there's another vacancy on the Supreme Court. Roosevelt offers that to Taft. Taft has to agonize all over again with the same decision, and he says no. A um, little bit of time goes on, and Roosevelt says, you've got to come back to D.C. I need you as Secretary of War. So Taft goes back. There's some health issues involved. Um, Taft's wife, Nellie, says, okay, this isn't going to sidetrack you into a judicial career. 
Maybe this will lead to something. So Taft becomes Secretary of War under Roosevelt. Roosevelt is elated to have his best friend working with him. This is really the first time they've worked closely together. Um, and, and their friendship carries them through. And then, of course, there's that fateful um, election night where Roosevelt announces he, he wins this overwhelming majority in his own right as president. He says to his wife that he's no longer a political accident. And he announces that He's going to consider his three and a half years filling out McKinley's term as his first term. And um, this is his second term and he won't run for re-election. It's something he later said he would give his right arm to take back those words. Um, so Roosevelt casts about for who's going to be his successor in the White House. And um, this is part of the dance. Now we're up to the uh, the White House dinner. It's the, the wives are there. Roosevelt is in a playful mood. And he says, you know, I see a slender thread hanging and, and I can't make it out whether this is the chief justiceship or the presidency. And um, Taft's wife, Nellie, says, oh, make it the presidency. And uh, Taft says, no, make it the chief justiceship. And so um, this is how they get to this point of that they've got this long friendship. They've got this um, long history of working together, this long history of helping one another out in their careers. And um, that's how we got to that. And of course, Roosevelt eventually anoints Taft as his successor. Taft says the thought of a, a national campaign would be a nightmare to him. And um, but he he goes on and he wins, of course. Ellie wants to be president, right? His wife does, and she's incredibly ambitious. And oh, yeah. Edith Roosevelt, right? Or uh, it, the TR's wife is the one who says, after gosh, he did. I wish he had talked to me about saying he's not going to run for another term because she says she <laughs> shuddered. And th those are all such moments, human moments that I love that you have here in presidential friendships because they are. with the with their wives, they, they also have to be friends in a certain way. And maybe that's an example also of how Taft was just a little bit squishy and probably not the best steel rod spine for somebody to be in the presidency as far as tr thought it but tr thought that about everyone right he thought uh william mckinley he said famously speaking of spines had all the spine of a chocolate eclair and he didn't back him he thought he was too far to the left he, he supported i believe joe cannon in that election the speaker of the house and right. then he's going to mckinley trying to get a job and he who's going to help him this guy is nuts and it's so easy to forget that today because we he's on mount rushmore everyone must have loved him but right. you know that's not always the guy you want to be at your dinner party and william howard taft did and that's that's a fascinating relationship to me because taft could have steered completely clear of him after the right, first exactly. fat joke yeah. Well, the thing about, you know, going back to Nellie Taft, you're right. She was incredibly politically ambitious. And it goes back to when she was a teenager that her father took her to the White House. Um, Rutherford Hayes was president. She was enamored with the glitz and the glamour and the prestige of the White House. And she made a vow to herself then that she would only marry a man who could become president. And she hitched her wagon to William Howard Taft, and she pushed him. There, there's this really revealing quote um, that she uh, writes later after um, the, the presidency. And she says, uh, and, and she's talking in context of the job as Secretary of War. And I, I want to read it because it's just so interesting. And you see who's really in control here. She says that the War Department job was, quote, it was in line with the kind of work I wanted my husband to do, the kind of career I wanted for him and expected him to have. <laughs> oh, my gosh. OK, <laughs> so she is the one really controlling that. And, you know, his family um, controlled things, too. They offered financial support. You know, when he took the Secretary of War position and um, but it was really Nelly who was the big driver. Love that. We're going to talk a little bit about one of our other pairs here and one of the other wives. And that's in light of LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And I always think of 
how he had his wife, he added the bird in there, basically, we say, right, Lady Bird Johnson, because thought those three initials would look really good because FDR had three initials and their monograms would be the same now, him and his wife. They would both be LBJs. And th this is something where he looked up, idolized FDR, as I'm reading your book here, Presidential Friendships. They're, they're not peers. They're not coming up together the way that, say, Nixon and JFK did we we hear about that famous train ride they take as young men talking about their lives and their future Taft and TR have many of those conversations that build this friendship that we dig into or you dig into for us here in presidential friendships but LBJ when he first goes to Washington FDR is already this titanic figure he does not lack for hero worshipers he's he's also in the last years of his life he's he's already president he doesn't really need another sycophant after him or another uh, people seeking something from him because he's you know you're a powerful president then as now people want things from you so i wondered how does lbj get past that how does johnson go in there and say i'm this nobody from texas here's this guy who's the wildly successful as far as re-elections and and the wartime president winning winning re-election you know a few couple times and how does he go in there and say i'm a, i'm kind of this lanky kid from texas so different from this patricia new yorker how does he get past that and make lbj or i'm sorry make fdr maybe i should stop using initials make roosevelt the second roosevelt but that's confusing with the first but how does he make franklin roosevelt president franklin roosevelt let him inside a little bit beyond instead of just keeping him away like he did so many people it's a fascinating story between fdr and lbj and that you know they um i think they saw themselves in each other that they both were men who um loved pulling the levers of power um they were both good at it Neither one had any particular compunction against, you know, bending rules or doing things. It was power that was everything. So why did FDR pay any attention to this kid from Texas? And I think, you know, we have to go back to when they met uh, for the first time in person. Um, LBJ had just been elected uh, congressman, 28 years old. Uh, been elected congressman and um, in, a, in a special election. But just before the election, two days before the election, LBJ had collapsed on the campaign trail, um, had to have uh, emergency appendicitis surgery. And um, so he's in the hospital. FDR goes and does a fishing trip off of Galveston, Texas, and um, LBJ arranges to be able to meet the president. And, and we have to remember that LBJ campaigned against a number of other opponents, um, surely on supporting the president in everything, including the court packing scheme. Um, and so the nation was watching this election and we know the president was watching it because this was a referendum on the president. And uh, Johnson, of course, wins uh, more than double the number of votes of anybody else. So he meets FDR. And, and, and they're, they're both sizing each other up. They're smiling broadly. Um, and Johnson doesn't want that conversation to end. But, you know, FDR is a busy man. He's got other people to, to talk to and to have this picture taken with and things like that. And FDR doesn't really want the conversation to end. So he invites Johnson to join him on the train, a uh, 300 mile trip on the train, and the two talk privately. And, you know, Johnson exaggerates all sorts of stuff, his interest in naval affairs and fishing. I mean, he, <laughs> he's just trying to ingratiate himself to the president, and the president, you know, bought it. and. Like I said, I think they saw themselves in each other. But it was a very different kind of friendship or relationship than TR and Taft had, which, as you pointed out, was this warm, personal friendship. The one between Johnson and FDR was really more a um, 
more professional. Not to say that they were not fond of each other. And, you know, FDR would call um, uh, Johnson a, a, a dear old friend of mine when he'd known him for just a year, you know, an old friend. But um, so they both saw in each other things that they could get from the other. And um, I think FDR liked Johnson's enthusiasm, his being savvy. He saw him as um, uh, an up and rising political leader. And he thought, you know, I'm going to pay attention to him. Now, while we had, you know, Taft and TR, we, we see at different points in their careers, they're helping each other. And there's certainly things that um, FDR helped Johnson with and vice versa. There's also times when Johnson finds himself um, kind of bummed out that FDR is not paying attention to him. He can't get an appointment with the president. He's not invited on a train trip through Texas later on. Um, so it was a relationship of political expediency in many ways. You're enjoying my conversation with Mike Purdy. He's the author of Presidential Friendships, How They Changed History. You can find our guest online at presidentialhistory.com, as well as on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I'll link to all of those accounts at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. Author Feather Schwartz Foster, who I interviewed about her book, Mary Lincoln's Flannel Pajamas and Other Stories from the First Lady's Closet, writes of the book, Presidential Friendships is a nifty read. At only 100 pages, it's short, sweet, and snappy. It does exactly what Mike Purdy intended. To demonstrate the dynamics between men who became friends and occupied the White House. Roosevelt and Taft, personal and intellectual peers, and diametrically opposed personalities. FDR and LBJ, separated by a generation gap, but two of a kind. So there you have Feather S. Foster saying exactly what you just did about them being two of a kind. And I like to picture Roosevelt in that scene. Franklin Roosevelt is sizing up what he knows he's being buffaloed by LBJ and saying this kid is good at it because that's how that's how a lot of politicians go. Right. That's how they get a lot. And be, in fact, it was Richard Nixon in the 90s, uh, 92 in the primaries. And he said, keep your eye on, on Bill Clinton when he was on Larry King. He says he knows what he's doing. And. Larry King said, are you nuts? He has no money. He's not funded. He's, he's unknown. He gave that long, boring speech at the convention nominating Dukakis. How could you, you really, you think this guy is going to be the guy? And he said, he's all oh, that's true, Larry, but he's very shrewd. And when you think of Nixon and, and Clinton and those, those politic abilities, although I'm sure speaking of right arms, Nixon probably would have traded his to have that human touch that, that Bill Clinton had, but politicians see something in each other that look, that they often look beyond what we might see we might think oh gosh he's he's making up that but that can work for you in politics when you're trying to ingratiate yourself in one little episode of your life you really build up and that's what feather s foster was focusing on there she was kind enough to submit also a question for you about presidential friendships so let me read that to you feather asked knowing that tr and taft met as young men and parents of small children any thoughts on the relationships between the wives. In later years, Nellie Taft and Edith Roosevelt were cool, but what about when they were young wives and mothers, unquote? And I think a little bit of that maybe applies also to Lady Bird Johnson and to Eleanor Roosevelt. So what about that? What about the wives and the roles that they play in those friendships, in those relationships? I think in the early days, they uh, the wives uh, were probably much better friends. Um, but I think coloring the entire relationship is going to be Nellie's ambition, her political ambition. And I, I think that there may have been uh, some um, oh, concern of hers that she sees that um, Theodore Roosevelt is outshining her husband. And, and I mean, Roosevelt's a charismatic person. William Howard Taft was not charismatic. He was he was jovial and friendly, but not charismatic. And so I think in the early days, I, I, I can imagine, you know, the 
the two men, Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft, you know, walking to work together, talking about their families, probably getting together with them. They're all trying to find their bearings. They're raising young children. Um, but I think as their careers continued to progress, I think we found Nellie becoming increasingly political and pushing her husband. And I think that probably caused a little bit of um, grief between the wives. There's the story that I don't know all the details too, but when um, the night before Taft's inauguration, um, Theodore invites the Taft to spend the night in the White House. And um, it's characterized later by, I think it's uh, Roosevelt, either Roosevelt or Roosevelt's wife, as that dreadful dinner that they had with the Taftists. So something went on um, that, that didn't work out real well between them. So even by then, they were um, th there was tension in that relationship. I like that they, they do come back at the end, which we certainly will do, because that's what you want, right? Because you do like both of them. We we can't see their personal charisma. We could read it and, and know what they were like. And that's what a great presidential historian does, as you've done here, Mike Purdy, in presidential friendships, is show us who they are. And it just so happens that they still have the ability to charm us when, when they're presented to us. And we wish that we were the third friend in that group, but three is a crowd. So close as <laughs> we can get here, in this case, five is a crowd. So the closest we can get is picking up and reading your book here, Presidential Friendships. I want to mention another presidential historian, David Petrusha. He joined me to discuss his latest book, Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, which was on FDR's 46 out of 48 state landslides. So if you wonder how you win that many states, and if you're somebody out there who wants to be president yourself or you're pushing your spouse to be president someday, that's your dream. You may want to pick up a copy of David Petrucci's book there, Roosevelt Sweep Station, to figure out how he did it. So he gave me a question here to ask you. It's a video question. So let me roll this one from David Petrucci and get your response. We all know that opposites attract, or at least that's what we've been told over and over again. And we certainly know that T.R. and William Howard Taft were opposites in many ways. But what do you think originally attracted T.R. to William Howard Taft? I think that T.R. was probably attracted to Taft because he was not assertive. And, and, and in, in the friendship, you know, Taft would do what Roosevelt wanted. I mean, Roosevelt is this larger than life personality. Um, and, and I mean, I want to say on a side that I think Taft has been underrated as a president. I, I think he was very solid. Um, he probably never should have been president. He probably should have been on the Supreme Court from the beginning. But um, I, I think that there's this um, fact that TR feels that he can tell Taft what to do. And I think we see this played out in their careers where Roosevelt is the public face. He's the idea guy. So this is when he's president and Taft is, you know, either governor general of the Philippines or secretary of war. And what, what happens is Roosevelt sets the policy and Taft implements it. He's a, a good administrator and a faithful administrator. And I think we probably, um, th there were probably some parts of that that we could see earlier in their friendship in terms of how they interacted with one another. Of course, that ends up being the, uh, sowing the seeds of their eventual um, uh, breakup of their friendship because Roosevelt has rose-colored glasses about Taft. And he says at one point that he thinks that Taft will be a better president than uh, Lincoln or Washington accepted. Those would be the only exceptions. And so he, and, and part of this goes back to Theodore Roosevelt's ego too, I believe, that Roosevelt felt that if he could get a president installed after him who would be great, that would show that he 
Roosevelt was a great president as well. But it all, of course, all fell apart. And, um, you know, when Taft became president, he made presidential decisions. He was not a clone of Roosevelt, never was, never would be. But Roosevelt thought he would, was a clone. And I think that goes back to their earlier friendships. He thought he was a clone of him because Taft is an agreeable person. And so you have an agreeable person like that and you go, oh, this is a great guy. I really like him. He agrees with me on everything, you know? So I, I think that's part of why they, um, Roosevelt liked Taft. And, you know, we see that played out in their careers. Um, and like I said, that sows the seeds for their eventual uh, breakup. I think that Taft has something that a lot of successful politicians have, and he's not very successful there in, in the presidency, of course. But a lot of them, people will say, this is another another uh, Bill Clinton thing. I mentioned President Clinton earlier, but where Newt Gingrich would say, I would walk in there and I would walk out and I would say, in the Oval Office, there being the Oval Office, and say, what did I just agree to? He says, I'm sure he agreed with me, right, didn't he? And a lot of presidents have been like that. You know better than I that if everybody leaves thinking he agreed with me. He agreed with me. FDR agreed with me. It's something that is in Roosevelt Sweepstation there, David Patricia's book. And with Taft, he's, he's just, all right, I'm going to let this guy talk. And just kind of, he's probably just kind of glad to be around him. As you said, he, he doesn't have a lot of friends and this guy's bombastic and and he's got energy he's got the physical uh, stamina and and building his body that taft doesn't have i could see where he is just going along with him and then uh, tr just thinks well every time i ever said right bill right he agreed with me so he is just i i love that here in presidential friendships because their relationship can be colored by that falling out that they have in 1912 that's it looks very disappointing and looks very bitter and, and it was at the time but in the history book so i love that you have that in there yeah and I, I think that you know as i've reflected on this that i would say that taft had the bigger heart and theodore roosevelt had the bigger ego and and, and that's what really caused the conflict all taft ever wanted was to be friends with roosevelt and Roosevelt didn't know what to do with himself after his presidency. Um, he had loved every minute of it, and he didn't know what to do. And he sees Taft making decisions that are different than what he would have made. But the real censure, and, and again, this says something about Taft, that, that, that Taft is this, you know, what you see is what you get kind of guy. And, and, and so after Taft is elected president, he writes a thank you note to Theodore Roosevelt, which, well, he should. But he's not very politically discreet. And, and so he says to Roosevelt, you know, you and my brother Charlie had more to do with me <laughs> being elected than anybody else. Roosevelt was incensed. What about your brother Charlie? <laughs> You know, I mean, I handed you the presidency on a silver yeah. platter and you're equating me with your brother, Charlie, and all he did was raise money. And, and so that really, yeah. that, that was the beginning of the unraveling of the relationship. I think it would have unraveled anyway, because they're in different roles and Taft was his own man. But um, Roosevelt's ego could not handle that. Well, easy here. We're, we're talking about three gentlemen with very big egos, uh, OBJ, FDR, and TR. And I'm glad that Taft has taken over a little bit. And you and I are, are focusing on him a little, a little more than, than probably most people might have. He's, he's mm -hmm. kind of only seen as a reflection there of, of Theodore Roosevelt and defined by that loss and by being made president. But he was a, a great influencer and part of history in his own right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely yeah. he was. You write in Presidential Friendships of FDR, quote, Roosevelt had a well-deserved reputation for steering and dominating conversations, something for which Johnson was also known, unquote. Now, that sounded familiar, which is why I paused there, because we were just talking about how his cousin did that. And 
LBJ also observes the time, how he's watching and trying to learn, right? Always uh, a good politician also does that. They're watching, they're learning, they're listening, they're studying. And that's what he observes, does LBJ. He says, quote, the president's style and manner and picking up a few tips for later use. That's how you describe it. So the younger Roosevelt was kind of kind of patient zero, kind of the, the OG president. He was the original guy that they all patterned themselves after to one degree or another because it's not just Taft taking over, but FDR emulates his fifth cousin so much on a lot of these things, emulates his square deal with the New Deal, this kind of thing. And then, of course, we, we have the Great Society with, with uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson. So I wanted to ask, what is the through line here all the way from 1901 that dark moment where theodore roosevelt's thrust into the president through the presidency of lyndon johnson and that's that's within obviously our living memory what's the through line because you say here the subhead of your book is how they influence history so what is that through line what did they learn and carry through those generations yeah, that's a great question i mean i think they are successively picking up about how to exercise political power. And, um, and it's the threesome of the, the foursome in this book that, that do that very effectively. Um, Theodore Roosevelt um, knew how to give a speech. Um, he was charismatic. He knew how to use power. He loved using power. His fifth cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, as you said, patterned his career after Theodore's. And he ends up learning how to use power. And, and, and you're absolutely right. You mentioned a while ago that people would leave FDR's office thinking that the president had agreed with him because you know, he would smile and nod and yes. And then you've got Lyndon Johnson, who is observing Franklin Roosevelt. Of course, he, he perfected the, um, you know, the, the nonstop talking that FDR would have. And, Johnson became known for what's called the Johnson treatment, you know, grabbing his opponent by the lapel and leaning in and, um, you know, threatening, cajoling, encouraging them and trying to get his way. Um, something that FDR, of course, could never do because he was uh, seated in a wheelchair. But, but FDR did that through words. Johnson did it through a combination of words and physical actions. And I think we see um, you, you know, the emulation that each of these men have for the other, Franklin for Theodore and Lyndon Johnson for FDR, that they want to do good. They want to influence history, even if that means they have to bend a few rules along the way. And so thus we've got the, the experimentation of the New Deal. And, um, and you've got Lyndon Johnson, who has this background growing up poor in the hill country of Texas, wanting to do good. He, he, he gets electricity for the hill country of Texas only because he directly appeals to President Franklin Roosevelt and gets him to agree. And, um, and, and then you've got Lyndon Johnson, who brings in the great society. Again, he's always conscious of his roots. And what's really interesting, of course, is you've got the two patrician Roosevelts who are populists, as is Lyndon Johnson. And yet they ended up seeing the need for helping the people. Of course, a lot of people will say that it's Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the eyes and ears and conscience of Franklin, and uh, kind of pushed him uh, to some of his actions. You talked about the history and those through lines and about that that's all social advancement that I think, uh, despite what maybe some of the things that that might have been said in the Taft years about that, or even as far back as the, the John Quincy Adams years about, about advancing public works, the role of the federal government, that all is such a big through line. It's something we, that we still talk about today, just the role of government. But to me, I'm going all the way back to the minute that, or the 
second split seconds that Leon Cholgosh pulls that trigger and shoots uh, William McKinley, who I realized as I was planning to ask this, I have an autograph of McKinley here, comes off one of his checks, but wow, this nice. this rather staid man who doesn't have that that bombastic personality of of any of the men we talked about, probably more like Taft in temperament, although although was stronger, resisted that call to war in the Philippines, for instance, which certainly showed he did have some spine, but it ticked off TR, who wanted war now, today, tomorrow, yesterday to declare war. And right. uh, but, but my thought is, if that moment doesn't happen, if Theodore Roosevelt doesn't end up becoming an accidental president, if, as he feared, he his candle had just burned out after four years as number two under the wildly popular William McKinley, he doesn't become president. He doesn't pick Taft. Nobody has any reason to pick this fellow who's a cousin of his in a wheelchair from New York as president. No, no one wants him. We don't get Lyndon Johnson. He maybe has a lot of those. He doesn't have a real good influence for things like his uh, – bipolar disease, the things that he that he suffered with. That's uh, something that when I discussed it with Betty Boyd Caroli about her book, Lady Bird and Lyndon, the hidden story of a marriage that made a president, which is a fantastic book. I want to go back and listen to our interview and pick it up, everybody out there. But I want to ask you to prove the thesis there of your How They Changed History subtitle. Without McKinley's death, if TR doesn't become president for some reason, how is our world today changed because we didn't have those presidents play a little bit of what if well that's a great question and i'll add into the mix and then i'll try to answer it i'll add into the mix uh you know what if franklin roosevelt had been assassinated before his inauguration there was that attempted assassination and what would our world look like without franklin roosevelt as president so you know let's go back though to theodore roosevelt and uh he serves four years as McKinley's vice president, let's speculate. And um, does he make it on his own? Maybe. I mean, he was certainly a charismatic person. He certainly had presidential aspirations. Uh, Would he have been able to win in his own right uh, without that assassination uh, propelling him into the White House? It's one of those what ifs of history that we don't know. And then there's the ripple effect that you mentioned about Franklin Roosevelt. If Theodore had never become president, what about Franklin? I mean, Franklin was banking on the Roosevelt name um, in 1932. And he also had going for him that Hoover was, you know, this dour personality who was presiding over the Depression. And people said, we want a change of, of some sorts. So um, I guess I would I would speculate, and it's only speculation, obviously, but I would speculate that Theodore Roosevelt would end up becoming president anyway. Um, you know, would he serve, probably serve two full terms? What would happen to Taft? I mean, there are... Uh, the, we could spin these out in a whole bunch of different directions and um we simply don't know yeah well to me i can't help but think how much would be different and as you said there those there's many of those what ifs if uh giuseppe zangara and i just want to let everybody know and you know mike purdy that i was disciplined enough not to shout out the name of the assassin of tempted assassin of fdr but if that fellow is unfortunately just uh you know few inches half a foot taller doesn't have to stand in a chair that breaks uh we lose fdr that's the man in the high castle that's the premise of that alternate history there but uh, without tr to think that we could even be asking that question is so huge because you think about that that's 70 years of the of the century that that we're speaking about this man this influence this carrying over the result of these friendships and don't forget we do have taft there as the chief justice think about how much influence the chief justice of the supreme court has uh fdr is the vice presidential candidate if folks want to read david petrucci's book the year of the six presidents he is one of those six presidents in there he's the vice presidential nominee for james cox that year so that's that's another influence that we have it's think about how much we had roosevelt's on the ticket tickets presidential tickets in those first 45 years of the of the Amer- of the 20th century is really amazing and so i love that i think when people read this book they'll they'll really absorb that part of it and say we're living in the world that was inter- that was influenced so much by these two friendships 
I want to close the final question. And that's that you do list several other pairs of presidents in presidential friendships. You mentioned Washington and Madison. That's a fascinating one. Another uh, father-son dynamic is between Washington and Monroe, this young soldier, this old soldier, uh, Hoover and Truman. We mentioned Hoover there. We can give Hoover a little bit of uh, a little bit of redemption or praise there that he has a relationship with Truman. Uh, Truman, however, with Eisenhower, not that's a good one to go back and read that 101 presidential insults for, things going back and forth there from Truman. Uh, Truman did you a great favor because he evaluated so many of his predecessors, went through and, and uh, right. ticked off some, right. uh, some objections to all of them. But uh, Eisenhower, Nixon, that makes sense. Bush 41, and I mentioned President Clinton earlier, uh, another another bit of i guess you'd say redemption from being a foes although not personal foes as as we saw i think it reminds all of us in our lives especially today so many people go into a political conversation with even a relative and will not be able to be friends anymore not be able to be breaking up families so i i love that about presidential friendships that is a great part of the book but i wanted to close by asking you to make your pitch for the book i could talk about how great it is all day why should readers pick up a copy of presidential friendships to learn about these two pairs of presidential friends so that they could continue to learn more and they'll want more and you could continue to bring us more this book becomes a bestseller and you share more about pals who changed the world at the very top of the american republic great question and i think that the reason people should read the book is because it, it helps us understand American history through a different lens, and it's the lens of friendship. And it's something that we can all understand and appreciate. Um, we all have friends. We know their value in our lives. But I think we miss sometimes the fact that um, even our presidents have had friendships with other presidents and how those have been significant. And it as we talked about at the very beginning, that these friendships help to humanize these men. We've got Taft's big heart and Theodore Roosevelt's big ego. And how can they be friends for so long? And then they have this you know, horrible blowout in 1912. And then they have a limited reconciliation um, in later years. And, and you know, Taft is weeping at the funeral for Theodore Roosevelt um, and, and says, you know, Roosevelt was my best friend. And he's grateful that they, they did have that limited reconciliation. And then with FDR and LBJ, um, as we've talked about, it's not the kind of personal friendship. It's a political friendship. It's one of expediency. They both need each other. Um, they both like each other, and they both help each other. FDR probably would not have been reelected in 1940 to a third term without LBJ raising campaign cash a little bit illegally. And LBJ's career would have been cut cold if President Franklin Roosevelt had not cut off the IRS investigation into that those illegal campaign contributions. So we see that relationships make a big difference. Friendships make a big difference in presidential lives and in our lives. And the book is a way to humanize it and a way to see our history through a different lens. Well, Mike Purdy, that's what you do as an author is give us that history through a different lens. And I so appreciate that. I'm so glad that you came back and joined us again here on the History Author Show to talk about presidential friendships, the name of your book. Thank you so much for giving us a look, uh, making us as close as we can be to a seat at, to sitting at a presidential dinner between these presidents. We get to we get to do that here through your book. And I enjoyed it so much. These two Roosevelt's influenced successors so much and through them influenced the world that we live in today. I wish you the best of luck with the book. Look forward to our next conversation and to your next book. I hope everybody out there will forgive my exuberance today, but I was really excited about this book and to speak to Mike Purdy. If you want to be excited too, who can't? use a little bit of excitement in their lives, please do go pick up Presidential Friendships or his previous book, 
101 presidential insults. You will be glad you did. And you'll look at our presidents, those faces on money and carved into mountains a little bit differently. Again, Mike Purdy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dean, for having me. I appreciate it. Again, the book is Presidential Friendships, How They Changed History. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. By buying a book through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. My thanks to Mike Purdy for joining us today and for sharing a deep dive into the relationships of two sets of presidents who helped shape the American century. You can find our guest at presidentialhistory.com and on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Those are all linked on the episode page for this show. Also, please do remember to check out our interviews about Mike Purdy's previous book. That was 101 Presidential Insults. Plus, if you're in a presidential frame of mind and you want to meet the ladies behind the men, ladies who made the man, as the old saying goes, please do check out my conversation with Feather S. Foster about Mary Lincoln's flannel pajamas. Those stories of first ladies, or my gals as she refers to them, really bring history alive. Heather is so much fun. My interview with her has a really, really sweet spot in my heart because it was so much fun. I think that really comes across in that interview. And Mike Purdy and I had a lot of fun in our conversation too. As you know, I like to talk presidents. If you like to hear people talk about presidents, please do go check out those two interviews with Feather Foster and my previous one with Mike Purdy. I'm sure you'll love what you hear and have a lot of fun too. And even if you don't, let me know. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio, YouTube, or wherever you enjoyed this journey into yesterday. Until that next trip into the past together, on behalf of Mike Purdy and the four presidents that we got to know a little better today, thanks so much for time traveling with us, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.